Alrighty, it's time to finish up the Ask Me Anything. Well, not finish up. We won't be doing that today because there's so many questions still. <laughs> However, we will be making strides towards the finish line. So this is going to be part of the lifestyle category for all the questions pertaining to just my everyday life that are not journaling related or stationary related. So let's just get started because it's going to take a while. How is your new job going? My new job is going really well. It's a lot of things. There's a lot of feelings that I have about it. Um, it's really wonderful work. I'm happy to be doing it. I'm really grateful. I think I had hoped that it would give me some answers, some life answers for how I want to continue on after the summer job is over and what I want to do with my future. <laughs> um, but I don't feel like I have gained any more knowledge than when I had started or before I had taken this job. So in that sense, I am I feel a little frustrated because I just don't know what I want to do next. But it's going really well. I love having an opportunity to go out and explore every day. Favorite bean story. <laughs> I think Bean and his relationship with the stuffed animal Bun Bun, who is a bunny rabbit, that I bought for myself when I was working at a toy store. And this rabbit was a rabbit that had sat on a shelf for months and months and months. And every day I'd come into the store, I would look at that rabbit and I would think, I would really love to buy that rabbit. That rabbit looks so cuddly and warm and cozy, but what am I gonna do with a stuffed animal? Uh, and I didn't want to spend the money <laughs> and yeah, I just kept making excuses for not buying the rabbit. And then Christmas passed and I said, or Christmas was approaching and I said, if it is still on the shelf, if that rabbit's still on the shelf after Christmas, I'm buying it for myself. So Christmas came and went and the rabbit remained. and. As an employee of the store, I got 40% off. And so I bought that little rabbit. And I remember, I think it was like New Year's or something, walking to my car <laughs> at night uh, in the cold, cuddling this wonderful rabbit and just being so happy about it. And it became a rabbit that I ended up sleeping with at night. Uh, and then several months later, Bean came into my life and thus started his love affair with the rabbit named Bun Bun. And every day he would drag Bun Bun off the bed and either drag her under the bed or drag her into the closet or somewhere else in the house. And for a long time, I couldn't quite figure out what it was that Bean was trying to do. Then I finally discovered that Bean is dragging Bun Bun to a place where he's sleeping. So if he was sleeping under the bed that day, he would drag Bun Bun under the bed. He has dragged Bun Bun under that chair. He has dragged Bun Bun into the bathroom. And if he's sleeping in the tub, like he just, I don't know what it is about Bun Bun, but he really loves to have her around when he's sleeping. <laughs> it's really cute. How are you maintaining to be sane in this insane world? Sometimes I watch your videos and say, okay, I'm going to be positive just like her, but these moments are cut short. Can you share your secret recipe? <sighs> well, <laughs> I think it's a lot of things. I think inherently I am just an, um, an optimistic person. I was born optimistic and, or maybe it's not so much genetics, but I think both of my parents are actually really optimistic persons people. Uh, and I think I inherited that. And so I tend to not necessarily look at the glass half full, but even if it's empty, I'm still excited about it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I am blessed with optimism. However, that doesn't mean I don't have really dark moments and really low lows, in which case I don't share those things. I tend to keep it all inward. Maybe I write about it in my journal, which does help. Uh, maybe I talk to a therapist, uh, but I don't want to bring that into the public space because it feels like 
it feels like a heavy burden and I don't want to put that on other people because the reality is we all have things that we experience and struggle with and challenges that we face and lows that we try to dig ourselves out of. Uh, and so I just don't share those experiences because I don't want people to be overwhelmed with more negative thoughts when we already have to like battle so much. It is an insane world. Since you backpack, do you have a favorite trail and have you hiked or through hiked any long trails or are you planning to? Uh, let's see. I don't have a favorite trail. I definitely have... <sighs> hmm. I have hiked through, but not for any long periods of time. I think the longest through hike I've ever done was five days and that was in Alaska along the Kenai Peninsula. And I, yeah, I would love to do a much longer hike through. I would love to do the Appalachian Trail. That is a dream of mine. I don't know if that will ever happen. It's just as that would take so much logistical planning and time set aside. Um, but yeah, I don't think I have a favorite trail. I've really enjoyed being in the Gila wilderness. I really enjoyed being in Aravaipa Canyon. I've really enjoyed being in Alaska. Okay. What are some of your other collections outside of fountain pens and inks? I am a collector at heart that longs so badly to be a minimalist. I want to be a minimalist and I go through these phases of purging and minimalizing and trying to like have a clean slate, but ultimately I just love experiencing as much as I possibly can. So I tend to collect a lot of things. I have typewriters and little horses and little porcelain dogs and shoes and purses and clothing and hats and books and handkerchiefs and, and journals and I'm just like looking around and art. I love art. Uh, plants. I have uh, instruments. I just love collecting. It's it's a real problem and I know there's other things. Oh like Tamagotchis. I really got into collecting too at one point. Um, music books like you know, like, like these things. I'm, I have my ukuleles here on the floor with me because I was playing them. Anyways, so yeah, lots of collections. And I know I'm, I'm forgetting something. Antiques, blankets, wool blankets, wool things. <sighs> what qualities do you look for in a good backpack? Oh, I skipped one. I don't want to forget that. Um, okay, so I mean, it's for me, it's more of a feeling than actual like translatable qualities. I like I like things that make sense to me and work for me. It's really subjective. I like like in a hiking backpack. I like a thick, durable canvas. Uh, I don't like most, I don't like any of the like hiking backpacks, backpacking backpacks that you'll see in most um, outdoor stores. I just don't like the materials. Um, so like, I really love uh, Fjall Raven's backpacks, like for backpacking, because they're made of a really, really tough, durable canvas. And they have like really unique systems that are um, customizable and I like the colors they have beautiful like earth tones whereas like you go to a hiking store and a lot of the backpacks are like bright brightly brightly colored um <laughs> uh like what's the word nylon I don't know what the materials are I don't tend to like the materials uh anyways so yeah it's just I like things that maybe I'm not an ultra lighter. I don't, I'm not looking for something that's super lightweight. I'm looking for something that feels like it will last forever. And so many of the hiking bags feel like they're not going to last forever because I think the priorities are like really lightweight materials. And I like things that are 
heavy. <laughs> um, as far as like, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think I, I have, I mean, I guess I could say like if I'm for a hiking backpack, I definitely like having a chest strap. I don't need a waist strap, but a chest strap is definitely a must. I'm not super into padding. I like a more floppy bag. I like a bag that just kind of like falls over and is not super stiff and rigid with a lot of like reinforced shaping. <laughs> All right, moving on, because I feel like I'm not explaining that very well. Do you meditate or do other spiritual meditative activities? I have meditated in the past, although it hasn't been like a daily practice of mine in a really long time. <sighs> Yeah, I guess that's that. <laughs> uh, let's see. What is the longest pen pal correspondence you are still maintaining? Uh, oh, I have been really bad about pen pals lately. And I think that's because all of my pen pals that I am still kind of corresponding with came during the pandemic when everybody was in lockdown. So there was so much time and processing that needed to be happening that having a lot of pen pals just was really a wonderful thing. Uh, but now that we're kind of moving away from that and life is busy again, I just haven't been very good at maintaining those relationships. What is a question you wish someone would ask you, but no one has? I don't think I, I don't have anything in mind. I actually, when I, said I was going to be doing like an ask me anything. I didn't have any expectations. I didn't want to have any expectations. I just like left it all to everybody else to decide. What is a, oh, sorry. Also, what would you think as a perfect regular day and why? I think a perfect regular day would just be waking up feeling really well rested and refreshed and super inspired and excited to greet the day and just, yeah, be really productive and have a lot of energy uh, and just feel good mentally and have like a quiet mind that's not full of a lot of anxiety or other th things. I think just waking up clear-headed would be wonderful. What would be a trip you would like to make outside of uh, the US. Well, I would really love to do, I would really love to go to Scotland. I would love to do more of like a backpack through Scotland. I would love to go to Egypt and Jordan and Iceland. And so <laughs> either like these uh, really cold, gray, green, rocky coastal places, or these really hot places that I find historically appealing and interesting. Do you have any advice for people who have no prolonged hiking or camping experience, but are looking to do so? Uh, just go out and do it. Um, if you're nervous about doing hiking alone, then try to find a trail that is Full of people so that you don't have to worry about that part of it and you can just enjoy being out there. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't um, don't feel like you have to do a certain amount of miles or time to make it an official hike. Just like go out and go for a walk in in nature and just enjoy. Sorry, that's probably <laughs> not as detailed as I feel like I could go. Um, oh, and camping, like if you've never done camping, camping can be one of those slippery slopes where you feel like you need a lot of gear and you just keep like digging yourself into a deeper gear hole and it's very appealing. I get it like to buy a bunch of gear for camping, but it's not necessary. You can actually be really minimal if you don't mind like giving up some of the luxuries uh, and yeah, just keep them keep it all really approachable because if it's overcomplicated, then it will be too overwhelming to even try. Uh, let's see. 
What is your full morning routine? Um, it's really just, I mean, as of late, I wake up at four, I get dressed and I leave. So there hasn't really been a routine. Traditionally, I'll wake up, have my coffee, do a little bit of writing. And that usually is like something I do for the first hour. And then it's whatever I need to do in that day. Um, nothing else beyond that is really set in stone. How do you motivate yourself in life? What's in your updated backpack and do you have a skincare routine? <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. Um, right now my, my backpack, do I have it? No, um, I've, I'm not going to go into that because I feel like that would just take too much time. But I did do a kind of what's in my backpack that's more geared towards my the summer job that I'm doing right now. I'd be happy to do something after the job, like to show a modified variation. Uh, let's see, skincare routine is like almost nothing at all because I don't, <laughs> I don't wash my face regularly uh, and I don't do anything regularly. Every once in a while, when I feel like I need a little bit of self care, I'll wash my face and I'll put like a face lotion on or if I'm feeling really fancy and I happen to have something, I'll do like a mask or something. But most of the time, I don't even wash my face before bed, which I don't know if it's probably. <laughs> I don't have like, I'm not, no, we're not even gonna go into that. Okay, what motivates yourself? What do you, what, how do you motivate yourself? Um, oh, that's such a, hard question because it's so emotional um, depending on how I am feeling mentally if I'm feeling energized and inspired and clear-headed I can do anything I feel like I, I'm unstoppable I feel like a superhero but when I don't have that when I'm not feeling that then I'm not motivated to do anything and it's really hard to motivate myself. So honestly, I don't know how to do that other than just like being able to wake up and be feeling motivated because when I'm not, I'm not and I don't know how to get into that space. <laughs> I would love to see some of your sketches. Maybe I will share some at some point. I honestly don't draw very often. I like. I like the idea of it, but it's just not something that I've ever really truly got into or had the patience for. I've done it. I've enjoyed it. Sometimes I have phases where I'm like, oh, I should, I should be an artist and like really practice this, but I, I end up not. Dot's Breed. Dot is a Whippet Jack Russell mix. Have you always lived in the Southwest and where's the best tacos in Tucson? Okay, uh, I have, I was born in Tucson, Arizona and Tucson, Arizona was home base all throughout my life. And it's where I have lived for most of my adult life. As a kid, however, we moved every six months to a year constantly. We lived in Georgia and Alabama and New Hampshire and New York and California and just were bouncing back and forth all the time. But Tucson was always home base, so it's where I consider home. Where are the best tacos? For like street tacos, oh, I wish I could remember the name of it. It's a little taco stand that is right on the corner of Fort Lowell and Mountain in Tucson, Arizona. And it's always there, it's always parked there. They have a pork belly taco that is really darn good. And if you want something quick and cheap and easy and greasy, that's a good place to go. Uh, for a little bit more of a traditional fast food taco joint, the Taco Shop, which is on Broadway and Highlander. And that has been an establishment in Tucson for years and years and years. In fact, in when I was in middle school in the 90s, it was taco, the Taco Shop. So it's been around forever. And then if you want something a little bit more fresh and modern, uh, Sace Kitchen. Sace Kitchen at the Mercado St. Augustine is my favorites.
one of my favorites. Okay. For a person thinking about starting a YouTube channel, what would be the top tips and advice you would give based on your own experience and journey, journey of filming, editing, etc.? Okay. I kind of approach the, this, I kind of, <laughs> for better or for worse, this is my general approach to almost everything in life. Keep it really simple because if you overcomplicate it, then it gets really overwhelming or it becomes a source of frustration or uh, it becomes a money sink or whatever. Um, and keep it for better or for worse what you are inspired to do. Um, so like with my YouTube channel, it's kind of all over the place because I want to be able to share whatever I am inspired by at any given point. Because if I have to talk about something that I don't care about anymore or I'm not inspired about anymore, then that will come through in the videos and they just won't be enjoyable. So for me, it's really important to just be a lot more fluid and not like um, constrained to one particular thing. It also is really helpful for me to keep it really simple and do everything I can on my phone. I do my editing, I do my recording on my phone. If I had to do a lot more work and put a lot more work into it, I think it would be a lot harder for me and I wouldn't be as consistent with filming on my phone. Whenever I'm inspired, wherever I am in the world, I can just turn it on and start talking or recording. And that's been really helpful. As I have done the YouTube thing a little bit more, I have like a tripod, which has been really helpful. I have like a, a film light now, which I'm using, and which is also really nice. I just got that like, I don't know, a month or two ago. Uh, but for a long time, I just kept it really, really simple. And that was, that was good. Also, um, no, it just went away from me. I don't know where that thought went. I was like, okay, it's gone. All right. <laughs> I really respect how real you are in your YouTube videos. And you've mentioned occasional discomfort at being on camera, especially out in public. How did you overcome that and build your confidence to share your life and views, opinions in a way that seems so effortless? <sighs> hmm. I think part of it is just practice. I think part of it is when I'm feeling really inspired about a thing, filming at that moment is helpful because then I'm just so excited and enthusiastic to share that I feel less awkward about it. I think also having been a journaler for so much of my life, this feels like a natural step in that whole like process. This also feels like journaling in some way. And so it's easy to share. Sometimes when I'm feeling really awkward or I don't want to be in front of the camera, doing a voiceover is really nice because then I can kind of put together my thoughts a little bit and um, just feel a little bit more at peace about a thing. Sometimes like the pressure of facing the camera and it feels kind of like being put on the spot uh, can be a little bit tricky. So it's helpful in those situations to be just really inspired and excited to do a thing. Uh, let's see. What is one place anywhere in the world you hope to plan, you hope or plan to visit and why? Well, I think I kind of already answered this. Scotland is one of them because I have, I love the, the, the landscape and the climate and the history uh, and it's a place that I had actually I had already bought a ticket to go to Scotland in 2020. I was going to go for 10 days in June uh, by myself my first time abroad and I had booked um, some hostels and an Airbnb at one point and that was the only thing I had planned. And I didn't want to look at where I was going. I didn't want to make any more plans. I just kind of wanted to be plopped down and figure it out as I go. And then of course the pandemic happened and that never, <laughs> never materialized. But I would really love to go. Um, it just so happens that Brian also had plans to go to Scotland 
that year and then the pandemic happened. So that's something I really hope that he and I can do together in the future. I've also just always wanted to go to Egypt because like so many, I think I was as a young, as a little girl, I just was obsessed with Egyptian history, ancient Egypt. And so if I went to Egypt, I'd want to do all of the touristy things. Um, excuse me. And I'm having allergies. And uh, yeah, I just, I would really like to go to Egypt and I'd like to go to Morocco and just eat a bunch of food and smell all the smells and hear all the sounds and see all the sights. Uh, let's see. Are you originally from Arizona? Yes. What did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a million different things. I wanted to be a veterinarian and a writer and a historian, curator, archeologist, biologist, marine biologist specifically for a long time, zoologist. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be a ballet dancer. I wanted to be a mathematician. I wanted to be, oh, a chiropractor. Actually, that was more of my dad's thing. <laughs> he really wanted me to be a chiropractor so that I could help him out. I don't know if that was ever my dream, but as a kid, I, I used to say a lot that I would be a chiropractor. Uh, yeah, just everything, I think. And I still want to be everything and do everything. What's your go-to road trip snack? Oh my gosh, one sec. I don't I don't want to edit this video. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I have to I have to do that. <laughs> I'm also going to take a sip of iced coffee because my throat is starting to get a little hoarse. Okay. Uh go to road trip snack. Dried fruits, nuts, jerky. Um, top five movies. You don't really strike me as the movie type, but maybe you just don't talk about it much. It's true. I'm not much of a movie person. I tend to just like thinking about having to dedicate that much time to sitting in front of a screen like is really hard for me. And the times that I have gone to the theaters, I'm like, is it going to be over yet? <laughs> There's like, I remember one of the more recent uh, Star Trek's like was one of the few times that I was I had totally forgotten about the time and the movie was over and I was like wait what it's over I don't want it to be over I'm not ready yet I really enjoyed it uh, I don't even remember what one it was <laughs> to be honest I think maybe Wrath of Khan the new one <laughs> mm, I really love um i robot i've said that before like that i'm not yeah i guess i'm not a movie person i p.s i love you <laughs> i'm embarrassed to say like i really like that movie i just find it really charming as a kid now and then was one of my favorite movies i'm sure i'm thinking of forgetting a lot of movies but yeah i'm not a movie person uh, let's see, what was your favorite toy as a kid? I spent a lot of time outside and that was like, I would say, that was the toy that I played with the most. But I really, really loved American Girl dolls and I remember really being obsessed with this toy called Stretch Armstrong, especially the dog. It was like this weird rubber stretchy, figure that was stuffed with like cornstarch or something. So it just had a really interesting texture. I also really liked Tamagotchis and other virtual pets. Um, <laughs> and stuffed animals. I had a lot of stuffed animals. What does your perfect nature scene look like and how do you feel in that place? Mmm, ah, that's so hard. I definitely would say I probably am drawn to spaces where I can see the horizon. I really love having an open view. I love meadows and grasslands and tundra. I love mountains though. So 
not necessarily like planes where it just is an endless horizon. I like some like an open space that is bordered by something really interesting, like really epic mountains or or an ocean or something. Uh, <laughs> I have definitely felt really claustrophobic in heavily forested areas or places where I can't see the horizon coming from the Southwest where it's always like big skies. That's definitely something that's challenging for me. And how do I feel in that place? Just grounded, at peace, everything is perfect, perfect balance, harmony with the world. Like it's just, I don't know, to feel the earth beneath my feet, like it just, there's like this, a connection that's made and it feels so good and it feels so empowering. Do you ever annotate or draw in the books you read? Um, I think I've, no, I've never drawn. I have underlined particular passages uh, that I, or earmarked even, that I thought were interesting quotes or inspiring messages, but I don't I tend to, to write or make notes. I gotta blow my nose. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, would you ever be interested in recording any of your ukulele compositions? Yes, absolutely. I would love to do that. I actually have a friend that does a lot of recording and he and I have talked a lot over the past couple of years about doing something like that. And then our lives just keep happening and they're busy and COVID and just a whole variety of block it, roadblocks have like obstructed us from doing that. But I hope, hope, hope that we can do that one day in the future. What does your significant other do for a living? Brian works for a um, conservation organization called Sky Island Alliance, and he primarily is in charge of um, vol the volunteer organizing, um, camera or wildlife camera checks, um, um, wildlife monitoring, springs assessments, springs restorations, and other types of restoration work. Mm, and then he does a lot of office stuff that I know he's not excited about. He would much rather be out in the field all the time, every day if he could. Uh, let's see, how's life? Uh, right now, life is really great. I have a purpose. <laughs> I feel productive. I'm definitely tired. Waking up at four for multiple days in a row is a little bit like against my natural state. So I do feel pretty fatigued, <laughs> but life is really good right now. It's nice to have a purpose. It's nice to be productive. You've spoken occasionally about doing seasonal contractor type jobs, painting home repairs and so on. How did you get into that and learn those skills? Well, it all started when I was a little kid because my dad worked as a handyman all the time. So he had like his engineer job, his day job, and then he was a handyman on the side on the weekends and in the evenings. Uh, and so I would follow him around and I would get paid to help him out. And then I did that uh, basically all through high school. And then um, my ex-husband's family, they have their own business in which they do home renovation and design work. And so I have learned a lot from them and I've worked a lot with them. And when they're here in Tucson for the winter time, I have a lot of work with them. I get to do tiling and kitchen renovation and all sorts of random things, plumbing and electrical work. Uh, and lately I've actually, well, before the, the cuckoo job that I'm doing right now, I was actually helping my dad build a house and doing some electrical work and putting in windows and things like that. So I've just been fortunate to know people who do that kind of work and I've been able to tag along and learn and get paid. How are Fig and Bean doing? How have I been? Um, Fig is Fig is miserable because it's hot and he does not like the heat. But other than that, I think he's okay. Bean is just, I don't think Bean ever has a bad day unless if he's like stuck in his cage 
because we're out of town or something. I don't know. He's just a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. And like I've said, I've, I'm, doing, I'm doing good right now. And that's nice to be able to say, for sure. I wonder how your music tastes evolved throughout your life. Does the change in style of journals uh, and your overall aesthetic correlate with what you prefer to listen to? That's a really interesting question. Uh, and I'm sure like in there are elements that are that correlate, but overall, like my taste in music has always been pretty, <laughs> I've been really consistent. That's one of the things that I've been very consistent with. Now there are genres that have come and gone throughout my life. Like when I was in high school, there was certain music that I listened to because I thought it was really cool. Uh, and looking back, it was definitely not at all. Um, but most consistently, I love, love, love classical music. Baroque music in particular is my favorite genre ever. Uh, I do enjoy Renaissance music as well, but mostly Baroque. I love Baroque. I Baroque, 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 Baroque. I am obsessed with Baroque. And it has been something that I have enjoyed for so many years now. And really, that's like the only music I listen to every once in a while I get like a wild hair and I listen to something uh like a pop song or something I turn on the radio just to like you know listen to random stuff that I'm not familiar with but mostly I just really love listening to classical music and I need to blow my nose again I'm so sorry <laughs> Are your plans to always live in Arizona or would you like to live somewhere else? I always would like to live somewhere else. I'm always fantasizing about living elsewhere. Uh, but Arizona has been home and no matter where I am, I think we'll always be home, the desert in particular. <sighs> I have no idea. I'd like to think that I'll live elsewhere, but I kind of think that won't happen. Uh, and I think I just need to be okay with that. It is home after all, it's, so I can't complain. <laughs> what does your casual day look like? And what do you like to cook? Mm, it's hard for me to think about cooking in the summertime because it's, I mean, it's 106 out there right now. It's just too hot to cook or eat. Ah, food tends to be really basic, like meat of some kind and a salad, and that's pretty consistent. Um, occasionally, I will get creative and cook something more elaborate. I love making um, spaghetti sauce with lots of vegetables and meatballs. But I'm also good at roasting a whole chicken. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I guess cooking is not, so, doesn't tend to be something I put a lot of effort into. In the winter time, it does change a little bit because it's just easier to, to cook when it's cold out. Um, I'm really good at cooking lamb ribs. I like making lamb ribs, uh, doing a crock pot, that's fun. Uh, and my casual day, hmm. I mean, casual for me could be like going on a leisurely hike or going on a walk with the dogs or playing a video game or typing or reading a book or journaling or playing music, uh, laying in the hammock, <laughs> taking a nap. Yeah. All right, let's see. How did you introduce Bean and Fig? So. Oh, and which one did you adopt first? Fig came into my life first. He is a retired racing greyhound. He retired at four and a half years of age and I adopted him only two weeks into his retirement. When I got him, he was beefy. He was quite the athlete. He had back thighs that were just like <laughs> thunder thighs. Anyways, I knew I had wanted to adopt a greyhound and it was something that I'd wanted to do ever since I was a little little kid. And finally the opportunity came. And so 
talking with the adoption agency, it was kind of a long process. It took like three months or so to find a dog, but I definitely wanted a greyhound that was small animal friendly because I wanted to be able to introduce the dog to a variety of animals, cats and small dogs and children and other critters because I didn't know what my future would look like. And I wanted to not have to worry about that. And so that was partly why it took a while because they had to find the, the right greyhound that didn't have a super high prey drive and would be friendly with small animals. And Fig was one of them. And that was it. So he came into my life. And then, I don't know, maybe a year later, I decided to get Bean. And at the time I was renting a little apartment that had a room with French doors. And so that became Bean's room. And the French doors were like glass paned. And so Fig could see Bean through the glass, but he couldn't get at Bean. And so I just spent a lot of time with Fig on the outside of the room and me and Bean on the inside of the room and Bean just running around and observing Fig. Uh, when he's when he stopped showing any interest at all, where he didn't care anymore about about Bean, I started to bring him out into the the house and kind of carrying him around and letting Fig sniff him. And then when he stopped showing interest at that point, I went on a walk with the two of them, and and it just kind of evolved from there. It took I don't know maybe a month. It was a I took a long time to just make sure that Fig was not going to eat Bean. But I felt confident that he would learn. And I just, I've, I've done this before where I've introduced dogs to small animals. I had huskies and ferrets and huskies and rats and huskies and hamsters and huskies and mice and huskies and lizards. I've had a lot of small animals throughout my life and dogs that have had uh, like high prey drive and um, have been able to introduce and it just takes some time and patience and observing when they don't care anymore that's usually a good sign uh let's see do you want any babies <laughs> uh no i don't um i've never that's never been like a drive it's never been like a dream of mine to have kids. Uh, for a good portion of my life, I always said like, I'm not interested in having kids, but you never know because life is like that and full of unexpected things. And if it happens, it happens. Um, but it's never been something that I have planned for or prioritized. And now that I'm like 37, I'm kind of thinking I'm, probably won't ever have kids which I suppose on some level makes me just a little bit sad as like as a woman but also uh as someone that loves sharing things and I will knowing that I don't have someone to like pass these things on to is kind of sad a little bit but for the most part I'm I don't have any interest in having kids how is the music journey? Huh, the music journey is great. <laughs> right now, my instrument of choice has just been the ukulele. I've been really enjoying learning some new music pieces. I actually got this graded repertoire for ukulele classical volume one that I've really been enjoying. I am about halfway through the book. Uh, and it keeps getting harder and harder, and I can't imagine what the other volumes are like. So uh, yeah, I, this has been great. And there's recordings of all of these online on YouTube, so if you get stuck, you can hear somebody else playing the pieces, and it's wonderful. It has notation and tablature. So that's what I've been doing. I'm always a little bit tempted to play or to learn classical guitar but I know that will be a big undertaking. I have picked up and played the violin here and there. I have been playing the mandolin here and there. And my cello is currently with a luthier and I need to pick it up. It's, 
at a place two hours away from me, so I just haven't had the time, but I had to get some work done, so I'll be able to play that again soon. Do you ever have... Oh, are you ever in fear or do you worry when you're out in the field alone? Yes. I wouldn't say fear. I don't feel fearful, but there are times in which I feel uncomfortable and my senses feel really heightened because I'm just like super, super alert and listening and looking and just being very cautious and careful. Um, do you plan to protect yourself if something ever happened? Is someone always with you? So most of the time, I mean, with the job, I'm alone. Uh, I've done a lot of hiking, like for my own self, for fun, alone. Um, I do prefer, I really enjoy hiking with Brian. Like I just enjoy getting to share those experiences with him. So I would prefer that to hiking by myself, but I have done it before and I do enjoy it sometimes. Um, I do, I'm, all, I'm always thinking of like how I would escape or defend myself. It's just good to have like some kind of plan because when you're in a really panicked state, you're not thinking very clearly. So to have something in the forefront of your mind like that you're going to do, I think it would be really helpful. Of course, I've never been in that kind of situation, so I don't know what would ultimately happen. But I do have like a, a plan. I am always looking and being really careful and cautious. What made you leave your teaching job? Oh, I just, I love, I love the kids so much. And I really loved teaching in some way. Uh, I think like when I'm just really excited about something, when I'm passionate about something, my natural inclination is to share it with people. Um, but I just, it was so exhausting. I just would get home and have absolutely nothing left and I wouldn't be able to recover over the weekend because two days is just not enough time. And yeah, I would just be totally burnt out constantly. And it was really frustrating as someone that has like, interests in things, who wants to be creative and express themselves creatively and do things with their life and go on road trips and camping and hiking and play music and make art and write and just not having the energy, the mental capacity to do any of those things was just so frustrating all the time. And so that was ultimately like, it just didn't feel like a good fit. I do think about going back to teaching a lot just because I did really love the kids and I did really enjoy it in some way. Um, but I don't know, maybe I should try teaching at a different school or with a different age group or teaching different subjects. I don't know. I really don't know. But it was, it was just emotionally draining in a way that I had never experienced in a job before. Just, yeah, whoa, taxing. <laughs> of all the places you have camped, backpacked in Arizona, which is your favorite? Probably Air Vipa, Air Vipa Canyon. Do you listen to Howard Stern? Do you know he's a fan of yours? I don't listen to Howard Stern. Uh, and <laughs> I do know that he, at least historically, has been a fan of, of mine. I don't know if he still listens at all. Uh, I don't know if he's still journaling or collecting fountain pens. Uh, and since I haven't really been doing a whole lot of that con kind of content on my channel, I have no idea if he's interested in, in watching my YouTube anymore. But I did really appreciate it when he did. Uh, and I really appreciated the shout out because I got a lot of subscribers and some really awesome people I have met through Howard Stern. So yeah. <laughs> It was quite a surprise. He's like the last person on earth that I expected to be listening to my channel. I have not ever listened to Howard Stern, but growing up, I had an idea, a vague idea of who he was. And I was like, I don't know if that's the kind of person I want to be listening to. Um, <laughs> but 
Um, I really appreciate him nonetheless. How, what do you do as your actual occupation? Uh, right now, I'm just a field technician. <laughs> that is my occupation. And it's taking up a lot of my time. I have taught, I've been a teacher, and in between this job and teaching, I have done a whole, all the things, just trying to make money from all sorts of places, primarily home renovations, construction work, stuff like that. But also I make a little bit on the YouTube channel and then I was running an Etsy shop and I made some good money there. But after I'm done with the field technician job, I don't know, I need to figure out what to do next because I need to make money. I've also done like, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Rental management, <laughs> home. I was a manager for a rental play property. <sighs> Just all the things. <laughs> Uh, pirates or ninjas? Pirates, for sure. <laughs> In fact, one of my go-to Halloween costumes is Pirate and Bonnie. Okay. Oh my gosh, we're almost we're almost done. I have to go to the bathroom so bad. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite vacation you've ever taken? If you could go anywhere on vacation, where would you go? I want to go to Scotland right now because, especially right now, because it's 106 degrees out there and really hot and sunny. And I want to go somewhere where it's rainy and I could put on a light sweater or a jacket. And I want to be on the coast and I want it to be gray and bleak. I don't know if Scotland is like that this time of year. It's probably muggy and buggy and I don't know. Maybe Faroe's Island or uh, Nova Scotia. <laughs> somewhere, I just want to go somewhere cold. Uh, let's see. If you could, um, oh, and my favorite vacation. I've liked so many vacations. I can't, I don't think I could pick a favorite. Obviously, the trip to Alaska, hence the name Adventure Denali, uh, had a really long lasting effect, impact on my life, and it has stuck with me still to this day. But I don't know if it's my favorite because I've had so many amazing experiences since. What's it like living in Arizona? It's hot right now. <laughs> Great. I love, I love Tucson. I love the culture here. I love the color. I love the history. I love the desert and all of our really interesting flora and fauna. This is the most diverse desert in the world. So it's just really exciting to be here and get to see it. And there's definitely a source of pride to live in the Sonoran Desert that isn't bleak and desolate. There's so much life and it's really diverse and it's just, it's a beautiful place. What is the weather really like? It's hot. <laughs> it really is. It really is hot. Uh, for most of the year. And then winter is like heaven and it's perfect and everybody is really happy. What is the story behind the silver bracelet you always wear? Oh, this is something that I got. Well, I think it was given to my mom from my grandma and then my mom gave it to me uh, many, 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 many years ago. And I can't remember if it was given to my mom first and then to me or if my grandma gave it directly to me. I just, I don't remember. I've had it for so long. And then when I met Brian, he was wearing silver bracelets at the time. And so I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I should wear that. And I have been wearing it every day since and I never take it off. Uh, all right. Anyways, what is your degree and what did you teach? Um, I don't have a degree. Uh, it's not something I like to talk about. It's, <laughs> I feel, mm, I always wanted, I wish I had a degree. I love school. I love learning. I could be a career student, but every time I have gone back to college and I have gone back to college many, many times, and I'm always thinking about going back to college. Ultimately, I feel like I, this is a lot of money and I can learn all this stuff without spending this money. Uh, originally, I got, I was really fortunate. I had a lot of scholarships, 
but I was so indecisive and I wanted to learn all of the things. I studied music and history and <laughs> dance for a little bit and biology and writing and art. And I just kept switching everything up constantly because I wanted to learn all the things that I couldn't decide on what to commit myself to. And then my scholarship ran out and that kind of like, that ended it. I ended up becoming an after school art teacher. And then at that school, they then wanted me to teach art during the day. And then they wanted me to take on a couple more responsibilities. And before you know it, I was teaching geography and art and math and sometimes science and sometimes writing and just all the things. Um, and it was really, it was really cool to have those kinds of responsibilities. It was also a little bit frustrating because I didn't have a degree. The parents just knew me as the, the person that hangs out in the classroom. They didn't realize that I was actually teaching their kids and creating curriculum and staying until seven o'clock at night preparing to, for a presentation the next day. Uh, so that was hard for sure, like not getting that kind of recognition. And maybe going, if I were to go back as a teacher, I would actually get a teaching certification and then I would feel maybe better about it because then I would, the parents would know that I was teaching their kids. Um, can you make more videos? Yes. <laughs> if you could live anywhere, money was not a factor, where would you move? Oh my God. <laughs> if money wasn't a factor, then I think I would have a house like all over the place. I would have a house in the middle of a cabin in the middle of nowhere that was right on the edge of the woods with a big meadow, maybe a creek that ran through the property uh, that was like hours away from any sort of civilization. I would also want an apartment in New York City for those times where I felt like I wanted some culture and noise and music and sounds and smells and chaos uh, <laughs> and coffee shops. And I also want to live in a little town, a historic town that has a really beautiful little downtown center and beautiful historic homes and is walkable. And I never had to drive anywhere. I could walk everywhere. And there was like a little bodega and a little coffee shop and a little bookstore. And that would be, that would be my ideal town. Livingston, Montana has a lot of those things, but it's so darn expensive and just keeps getting more and more and more and more expensive. Unfortunately, those places are really popular and so they tend to be really expensive. <laughs> Do you have any new leather working ideas or prototypes? Not at the moment. How profitable is having a YouTube channel? Are you planning on settling down and having kids? Uh, what is your mother's state and have you ever planned to leave the US? Um, the YouTube channel is not, I'm not making, I could not survive on the YouTube channel at this point. It is a nice little supplement. It can buy me a week's worth of groceries, maybe two weeks if I'm lucky, kind of like goes up and down a lot. Um, but it's not something I can depend on. It would be really cool if it was. Uh, are you planning on settling down? Um... I mean, there's a part of me that always wants to like nest and grow roots and live in my forever home and, but I haven't found the space yet. So I feel a little bit restless. I feel like I'm still searching for that perfect place where I do want to like grow my roots. I don't want kids. I don't think I'll ever have kids. Um, I'm from Arizona and I plan on leaving the US. Like you mean to live? Oh, I would love to, but I, it just doesn't seem, it's not enough of a desire to like put all the effort into, that goes into like moving to a different country. Um, would I like to? Yeah, for sure. But I probably never will. Not gonna be, you never know. Life is full of unexpected turns. Do you have a steady job? Uh, I have a steady job right now that is temporary. <laughs> and then 
when this is over, I have no idea. And that's really stressful and I can't think about it right now. So that is the end of the lifestyle questions. The last part to this video is for ball jointed dolls, which is a hobby that I was in invested in for a very long time. And I have some people that would really love to hear me talk about it some more. So thank you all for watching. I'm gonna go pee <laughs> and I'm gonna rest my voice. I hope you enjoyed this. I'll talk to y'all later.